everyone. Um, as Christina mentioned, this is Stuart Mayer from the Insight team, and I'm really excited to see that so many of you are able to join us for this topic today. Um, I'd especially like to thank Mike Whitmire and the Flowcast team for moderating the event today. In fact, Flowcast is being very gracious and is willing to waive implementation costs for Insight's portfolio companies through June 30th. So I urge all of you that aren't yet customers to go check them out. Um, as always, I'd encourage you to continue to let me know if there's topics that you'd like to see covered in future webinars. Uh, as for today, we are really grateful that Jared Janik, the CFO from Eda Open, has agreed to share his journey through the SPAC process. And of course, thanks also to Byron Lichtenstein, who'll be sharing Insights perspective. Um, with that, I'm going to throw it over for Mike uh, to Mike from Flowcast so we can get started. Awesome. Well, thank you, Stuart. And thank you, Christina, as well, for, uh, for kicking us off and for getting everything organized here. Very excited for uh, today's presentation. So our agenda, pretty straightforward. We're going to go through uh, introductions here. We've already done a light bit of that, but we'll, we'll dive deeper into it. Uh, hop right into our discussion around, around SPACs and going public. And then, you know, we do want to spend a good amount of time on, on Q&A with the webinars. I mean, the goal is always to provide as much value for the audience as possible and get your questions answered. What better way to do that than to field your actual questions and answer those. So please feel free to submit those. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat. And as I see them come in, I'll, I'll try to address them in real time if possible. Uh, if not, we'll just save them up for the end and go for it at that time. And uh, do have my own housekeeping here. So you will receive, uh, so as I mentioned, please submit those questions and you'll receive a copy of this afterwards. Uh, recording will be followed or forwarded to your webinar. Uh, Christine will be able to help you out with that if, ne if necessary. All right, so brief introduction on Flowcast before we kick into the, the material. So who are, who are we? We build accounting workflow automation. We are created by accounts for accounts to help your teams work uh, smarter and not harder. And all of this was really founded out of my background. So I started my career in audit. I was with Ernst & Young for about three years, audited a mix of private and public companies, mostly in the entertainment field in Los Angeles. That was a lot of fun. Um, I then moved over to a pre-IPO SaaS company by the name of Cornerstone On Demand. I joined about a year before the IPO over there and experienced a lot of, I think, what the folks on this line are about to experience, which was just a wild IPO experience. I got there a year before and we had just taken on our first bit of money from Bessemer and they were like, all right, we're going public in 12 months. The problem was we had four people in accounting. We were on QuickBooks. We had never been audited and it was a complete mess in the back office. So they were like, all right, let's hire a bunch of accounts to get this going. And I was one of the first people they hired for that. Um, so I was there for three years. It was a great IPO, but it was a terrible back office experience and uh, excited to share some of those learnings as we move through the presentation. But really that experience was the, the kind of starting point for founding Flowcast was uh, frustrated in a status update meeting. Team wasn't working well together. And so decided to leave and start working on Flowcast. That was in 2012. Fast forward to today, we are you know, proud to be an Insight company. We have uh, actually now 1,300 customers take customer satisfaction very seriously. Um, some of our uh, logos listed off on the right here, the, the show off slide. And one of the things we take a lot of pride in is a fast implementation setup, you know, helping your team get up and, up and running and adopted on Flowcast quickly. Part of why we're able to make that nice offer of a free implementation, it's pretty easy on our end. So I'm, I'm more than happy waving that one. All right, enough about me. Let's kick into our learning objectives. So we want to talk, you know, for starters about how to assemble the right team. I mean, people are the foundation for going public. And as I just mentioned in my last role at Cornerstone, we had no people getting ready to do this. It was some bookkeepers ready to roll. And so we had to build out a team and we'll talk about how to hire out, um, particularly, you know, across the back office, talking about legal HR and FP&A as well. Um, and you always want to be ready for due diligence. I think this is sort of a, a mantra that every finance department should have because you just never know when an event could occur, whether that's a, a fundraising liquidity event, there are all sorts of things that could pop up. And so just being prepared with due diligence, it's always best practice. And I'm glad we had scaling come out a lot in the word cloud. We're going to be talking about that, about scaling your accounting and finance teams. You know, without adding a ton of headcount, there are really great ways to do that. Um, a lot of automation technology out there, a lot of collaboration tools like Flowcast to help your team work more efficiently. And so there are great ways to scale and keep the, the headcount down by leveraging really quality processes and great technology as well. So, all right, I'm done blabbering. Let's hand it off to Jared to uh, introduce himself and uh, dive into his background a little bit more. Thanks, Mike, appreciate that. Uh, my name is Jared Janet. I've been with Eda Open for just about three years now. Um, I've started my career in public companies. Um, 
first with a uh, insurance services provider, about $700 million global company, uh, ultimately became the head of their financial reporting. Um, and then went and did a uh, FinTech IPO as a controller, uh, became their CFO, sold to a public company. And then I embarked on a uh, private equity career uh, with a small company called Agilisys at the time. Um, we later changed our name to Infor. I was their global controller. Um, we did 30 plus acquisitions, went from 200 million in revenue when I joined to three years later, just over 2.2 billion in revenue. Uh, and then went through several CFO roles in, in smaller private equity companies, uh, all ERP um, enterprise class software before landing at, uh, at Eat Open three years ago. Um, so I've, I've had a good bit of M&A background. I've done 40 plus buy side deals, six sell side deals and a traditional IPO and now it's back. So really look forward to uh, sharing some of those uber painful experiences with you all. Yeah, so it sounds like you'll have some good good stories in there. And Byron, you want to you go ahead on your end? Sure. Uh, Byron Lichtenstein, uh, after the SPAC process, I am officially Jarrett's best friend. Um, but in, in reality, I uh, uh, so principal on our team here at Insight. Uh, worked with Jared and the team throughout the, the SPAC process and, and before from an on-site perspective, helping on uh, a couple of operational initiatives. And then as we kind of went through this uh, sale process, uh, got even deeper with, with the business. Uh, I would also say it's, it's amazing to see uh, how many participants there are. I was, on, I, was, I was on one earlier in the week around uh, cash and, and revenue operations. So it's, it's good to see where, where all of your heads are at in terms of, uh, or what you're fearing most, uh, but excited for, for this conversation. Well, you do have to have some appreciation for operational improvements, right? All that good stuff. Yeah. But yeah, going public is the exciting event, ringing the bell and all that good stuff. I do have a question, Jared and Byron, are, do you still get to physically ring the bell if you go through a SPAC? Kind of. It, it's different. Kind of. Jared do it. Kind of, it's different in COVID. It's it's super. They do do it. Well, well, let's let's pretend a non-COVID world. Do I? Okay, and the reason I ask is because my dream is to found a public company, specifically that moment where I get to ring the bell. And if a SPAC is going to rob me of that moment, no, Insight, Insight might be really frustrated that I don't want to do a SPAC. <laughs> so tell me, tell me more about the actual experience. Yeah, no, it, um, it's it's virtual today, um, but you're at, you actually get to go. Um, a limited number of people there, a limited number of people kind of in a terrace balcony level. And then um, we went on the NYSE. So they had a great marketing package for, for our debut and all. So you still get to do it. And hopefully you get to do it in a more traditional way in the future. Okay. So you still get, you get the experience and this will be a, all right. That makes me feel much better about the whole SPAC concept. And that's totally irrational of me as a founder to think that way, but Hey, that's part of, that's part of how we roll. Um, so I, I've already spent enough time talking about myself, but one thing I do want to note is that at Flowcast, you know, we pre-IPO companies are sort of our bread and butter. And so there have been literally dozens of, of IPOs on Flowcast uh, software over the last year. And so really excited to share some of the experiences that, um, that I've heard in chatting with the CFOs and controllers who are going through this most recent area of it. So, you know, in addition to my personal background doing it um, at Flowcast, we work with a lot of companies going public like Snowflake, Palantir, they all went public on Flowcast um, and they've had great success stories. So without further ado, Let's, uh, let's just do some level setting. I mean, let's take a really high level. We got some acronyms here. Uh, and Jared, I'm gonna kick it over to you for this one. So can you just define a SPAC for us so we're all on the same page? Yeah, so SPACs have actually been around for a decent, you know, several decades, I think. Um, and SPAC stands for Special Purpose Acquisition Corporation. And people call them a blank check company or, or otherwise. Unlike a traditional IPO, the, the SPAC goes public with the intent of doing an acquisition uh, within a limited period of time after raising the funds to do the acquisition. So it's really kind of a, a pre-funding, a business combination of sorts. Um, in, the, in the old days, it used to be more kind of a management team would assemble a SPAC to look for their next job and, and investors would invest in that team. Um, now it seems much more like a, a opportunity for sponsors um, 
to raise funds and, and do M&A through a different vehicle. Hmm. Hey, and Byron, what's your take? Yeah, no, I mean, I agree, obviously, with, you know, definition and, and, and all of that and kind of the, the history of it. You know, I do think that uh, the, the recent history, and I was reading an article the other day, since the start of 2020, there have been 550 SPACs raised, right, which is a, which is a fairly staggering number. Um, you know, I would say that, that um, we're, we're excited to see that it's another path for, you know, our companies and other companies to, to access the public markets, right? I think for, for a lot of the businesses um, where we've had, you know, SPAC inbounds over, over the last uh, few quarters or so, um, you know, a lot of it is, is uh, access to a new pool of capital, right? If, if you think you get to a certain scale, um, there's more, um, there's either more acquisitions you want to make or there's more investment you want to make. And before, you know, your, your options were fairly limited, right? If, if you, uh, you know, there were pretty strict guidelines in, or in terms of what the market wanted for an IPO. And so if you didn't meet those, you pretty much had to go private market. And then at, at a certain scale, there's, there's probably, you know, a handful, two handfuls of, of, um, kind of large sponsors that were large enough that they could actually help you accomplish your, your goals. And so you were limited to that pool for a long time. And now uh, with SPACs, you know, you get access to, to la the large public market and that public currency to, to continue with your strategic plan. So, I mean, we're, we're excited that it's a new um, path for, for our businesses and um, always very open to, to pursuing that uh, with, the, with our companies. And our, our, so the next question here is, when's the decision made to go public and what's the right vehicle? But I, I'd also love to, touch, to touch on, you know, what should you look for in the right spec? I've, I've taken a couple of calls with specs. I just kind of want to understand what the pitch is, what that looks like. We're not, we're not ready to do that, but I wanted to hear it. And uh, so I'm curious, you know, Jared or Byron, when you're speaking with various SAC or SPAC options, what do you look for? Like what makes one more appealing than the other? Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> I think the sponsor is really important probably more important than price, um, just because of the, the way the process works. So somebody can put a great price out there for you. And if you go through your pipe raise and the market doesn't think that price is right, your deal is either gonna blow up or you're gonna get traded down for the lower price based on, on the, the level of pipe that you're able to raise. So price isn't really key, like it might be more so in, a, in just a straight sale process. Um, the sponsor's ability to raise the pipe is really key. We, we had a unique, um, I think, structure with our sponsor where they actually had a backstop um, to help limit redemptions, um, which can also ultimately, you know, affect the, the price that you get when you, when you ultimately close the transaction. So the pipe and redemptions together and getting, you know, really a good sense of comfort around certainty to close at, at kind of the, you know, the terms that, that are being presented to you is probably as important as anything. And, and, and go, go ahead, Byron. As you say, and you know, I'd add on, I do think that um, I, I agree fully with, with Jared's points. I do think that the, that picking the right partner is, is really meaningful. And, you know, I think ideally you find, um, you know, it, it tends to be a few former executives um, you know, who have, who have either been in the public markets before from, a, from an operating standpoint or, um, you know, are dealt with the public markets from an investing standpoint. And I think if you can find um, a SPAC sponsor that, um, you know, we, we've talked to some that, you know, have done amazing things within payments or amazing things within cybersecurity or amazing things within um, your field, I do think that, you know, it's a good way of getting really good uh, board members, to be honest, onto your onto your board, um, and I think the piece around certainty is is um, is really meaningful. I, I agree with Jared that uh, you know you're you have to the thing that's interesting, and, and I don't want to jump the gun too much, but the thing that's interesting about a SPAC is you almost go through like a private equity process before right. you go out to the to the public markets, and so you know they're doing their diligence, and you're kind of choosing your partner that you're going to go with into the public markets ahead of time. Um, and so you wanna make sure that that partner, one is, is gonna be committed to you, is committed to, to 
raising the pipe. And then you have to think about, you know, the size of the spec that they raise and the size of the pipe that they want to raise. Um, but then, uh, you know, you also, there's a piece of it that's uh, not just commitment to you, but also that they know how to be good public company, you know, board members and, and actually know how to run that um, post, post the, the actual spacking of the spacking event. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, we got really comfortable with, with, uh, you know, the spec that, that with CC and, and the Newberger team uh, that, you know, worked with, with us on, on the E2 open spec um, because, you know, they had actually done, done some before, right. And they were very yeah. experienced public market investors. And so I think you get comfortable around that as well. Yeah. The, the market credibility for either just general public investment or your industry segment or whatever, I think is really important. And to Byron's point, it's a marriage, not a divorce, like a sale. So yeah. mm -hmm. you really want to do your diligence on them, just like they're doing their diligence on you. Cool. That makes perfect sense. All right. Well, let's, uh, Let's keep rolling. So for today, we're going to follow a theme of uh, people, process, and technology, May perhaps a bit of a trope, but it's a trope for a reason. And we're going to walk through these, uh, these three areas. So one of my favorite parts is assembling the right team. And, you know, is, is previous public company or exit experience essential? Um, if you don't have it for yourself, you should hire for it. So uh, things you'll need. And Jared, I want to kick it over to you when you're when you're hiring out a team. And I'd love to hear at different stages of business when you're when you're bringing in different roles. Um, but when are you looking for, OK, I need to get some people who ha understand public company uh, operations. So at, at, at early, I think early is important because I think, you know, one thing that I've learned in my career is you always want to prepare yourself to do the hardest thing you could possibly be asked which is ultimately an IPO, a traditional IPO. Um, although actually I think a SPAC's harder than an IPO because you've got the same amount of work to get done in half the time. So it, it's great from a investor perspective in terms of speed to market. It's a terrible thing for the back office in terms of it's really not easier, but it's faster. Um, that that kind of works against you in that time frame. Um, but I think you, you have to always think about, you know, tightening your clothes, getting better at, at no surprises from a forecasting perspective, um, you know, as, as you build your company out. <clears throat> yeah. And I'm sure Byron, you, you appreciate the speed of the SPAC, right? It gives you that yeah. certainty. Maybe the market's not going to crash. You hit that, that window a little more timely. So from your perspective, like, yeah, what do you, what do you enjoy about the, the, the process and, how do you think about the team that's being assembled and the timing of it? Yeah, I mean, if I think about the the process that we went through with with Jared and team, you know, I think there's a you know that team has a capital T on it, right? There's there's um, you know Deepa and Francisco who are the heads of you know kind of accounting and and FPNA uh, respectively, like they ran a lot of the process, right? And obviously Jared Jared did did a ton. Um, but you have to think about just all the items that are happening throughout. And, you know, uh, Jared and I were, were talking about, the, you know, doing our kind of like recap and, and the process. You know, Jared had something like 180 investor meetings he had to take, you know, through, through the pipe process and through the roadshows and all that stuff. And so, and so, I mean, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's like a full-time job just to manage that side of it. And so you need people that you can really rely on to, on the FP&A side, like, you know, make the for get the forecast right and, and make sure that you're going to hit them. And then on the, the, um, and, and obviously have all the metrics that, that, you know, we're going to present out to the public. And then on the accounting side, like getting that PCAOB audit and getting multiple years of that when you weren't planning to be a public company. Um, and we're a little bit of a unique time period now where I think, you know, we could talk later about, you know, some of the stuff that we're doing at Insight to help our companies prepare earlier now that we know that this is an option, but I mean, Deepa was deep in it. Like she, she was working with, with, um, you know, the accountants to actually like do a ton of work. And that was the bit, that was honestly the longest pole in the tent. And so, you know, if it wasn't for those two folks, like, uh, I don't know if we would have happened on the same timeline. So I think getting those people in place with enough time for them to really know the business in depth and for, you know, you guys, for the kind of 
you know, Jared and, and his team to feel like, you know, they, they could one, trust each other and two, know every, all the processes. Um, you know, I'm super happy that those two were, were in place. And obviously there's a huge team below each of them, but um, it's, it was, it was critical, at least in my perspective, to have everybody kind of working together for, you know, at least, at least a year, probably, maybe if not more. Yeah. Build, build that team dynamic. Those Go two ahead. are world class without a doubt. Like, you know, they ran the business and did all this extra work while, you know, we raised the money and having people that can do that at that level without direction was really key. Um, Deepa on the accounting side, you know, great public company background also. So she was going into a zone that she was familiar with. Um, I had some, um, it was a bit stale, but it was amazing how much of it is still kind of the same. Um, yeah. Level. And, and Francisco has built just a, a complete world-class, you know, KPI machine uh, in terms of, you know, we do a weekly forecast, bottoms up every week. And we know right where the business is at any time, which is, I think, exceptional. Um, but by what, a, what a feeling that is. Yeah, if, yeah. If, if, we didn't, if we didn't have that, SPAC might not have been an option. Like, you, you, yeah, you that's interesting. Pay. Even if you want to do a SPAC, if you're not ready, you can't do it. Like, you can't get out the door. Um, the level of risk of not being ready is just too high to the investors that you have a, a, a slip up and, and you, you'll for many quarters, bury, bury your share price. So we were, we were happy that we had, you know, prepared to do the hardest thing and that those options were available to us. Yeah. No, no. Sorry. I was just, just going to say, no, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, you, you go, Mike. You're good. No, that uh, you made that comment. It makes me reflect back on my cornerstone time. And perhaps that was the area we were most prepared in. Like I remember our CFO a year before the IPO saying, all right, we got to get budgeting and forecasting down. You know, we we're predictable revenue. We should be able to do this. I want to be so accurate with our projections that everyone thinks we're committing fraud. And I was like, all right, maybe that's not the word you should use to, to <laughs> declare how accurate we want to be, but, but point taken. Okay. That's, and you can do that in SAS, right? That's a very possible thing to nail it within a small percentage margin of error. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, I was, I was just going to say the only comment I was going to make is like, that's another consideration. I know earlier we talked about just what is a SPAC. Um, you know, the, the thing that, that, uh, folks should realize is, you know, these SPACs, you know, they don't have forever to actually get a deal done. Right when they go out, they pretty much are now on the clock for about two years to to get a deal done. And if they don't, the the money has to go back uh, to their own investors. And so um, there is time pressure. And and so if it if it's clear that you can't get out in time, like there's high likelihood that they'll move on. And so that is that is a consideration. Yeah, and Byron, you know, we didn't think about it, but I think it's a healthy thing for the portfolio companies to think about. If we had we we were AICPA audit as a private company, which is a, a different scope, and you know there's some different accounting principles that you apply. The pivot to the PCAOB and having to do you know two years of historical back audits and conform the current year to kind of the same thing. If we had done that from day one, minimally more expensive and more you know time invasive while doing it, um, doing it after the fact. You know, we, I'm amazed we got it done in two months. It was, but it was a two months worth of like seven days a week, you know, all hands on deck to get to that goal. So, you know, another area where, you know, a little preparation doesn't really cost a lot of time or, or effort, but can save you, you know, tremendous amount of time in terms of, of that process. Yeah. And, and as you, and as you mentioned that, like, you know, there are a couple of things, you know, since learning from this process that, you know, myself and, and the team here, here at Insight have, have started to, to think through around that. And, and so if, you know, as folks are thinking about that, um, you know, we, we have started to put together more resources and talk to, you know, several auditors, you know, that work throughout the portfolio on, on what it would actually look like to do PCAOB versus AI CPA um, audits and, you know, I think it's it's marginally more cost. It's a, it's obviously more work because the the standard like the uh, testing levels are higher. There's there's a couple other pieces that um, you know make it a little bit more burdensome. But you know, I would say if you know it's an option in two years, you should probably start getting PCA will be done um, sooner rather than later. 
uh, as a guy who did it and got audited in that world, I can tell you, yes, it's a lot more. And one of the one of the big differences, right, is really more of a look at c- controls and risk tracking and understanding of the process and the workflow going on. Um, so that's just one thing that starts to get audited more tightly as you become a public company. And when you're going when you're going public that fast and you need to get SOX compliant and all that good stuff, the behavior change that comes with that is incredibly, you know, it's so hard to get people to change how they've done things, especially if they've done it for five years or whatever. But as a public company, you're just sort of <clears throat> trying to figure it out on the fly. Uh, Jared, just before we move on to the next topic, one thing I found pe- people are very interested in just literally understanding what the org chart looks like. So when you were, I'm sure you were hiring a bunch of people throughout the process, but when you were raising money, can you give us a sense of what the org chart looked like? Yeah, so um, the, the two kind of key pillars we talked about were the, the two people that run those areas is accounting and, and FP&A. Um, and did you have, is it like a VP of finance and a, a controller or, or VP of accounting? What are, what are the actual titles? People like to get in the nitty gritty on this. Yeah, no, that's all right. Deep, Deep is the chief accounting officer. Um, okay. She's done an amazing thing. She, she built the team from scratch during the Take Private. Uh, and when we moved from Silicon Valley to Austin from a headquarters perspective. Um, and then, you know, we did 11, 11 acquisitions firing during that five year period of time. Wow. So, you know, we were, we were building the team up and when we went out, we were, you know, we we're already a 300 plus million dollar company. So a lot of that scaling happened pretty rapidly as we were, you know, acquiring those businesses. Um, on the fp side, we've got kind of a corporate team and then a, a business unit centric team. And so the, the business unit team is, is kind of like, you know, business unit CFOs that support the, the general managers of those businesses. They okay. in, they out. Um, and then the corporate team takes care of, you know, all of the inputs that go into the weekly forecast, the budget, um, all of the KPI reporting and the like. Um, under the, uh, on the accounting side, that we did build out a good bit. You know, during the process, we hired a, an SEC reporting director. Um, we, before the process, got a, a you know, a, a corporate controller for DEPA. Yeah. Uh, help, you know, with her span of control. Um, we have a shared service center where about 70% of our finance team resides in Kuala Lumpur that does not just transaction processing, but we actually do all of our rev rec there. We do a lot of our cash um, ac- activity there. We, we do all of our FP&A um, consolidation and reporting out of there. So some high value add things, not just you know the, the routine payables and fixed asset, you know, the, the easier things to offshore are done from there. Uh, um, yeah. Then, um, added in as we were going public, uh, uh, SVP of internal audit, um, who's bringing, you know, two resources in and managing the consultants that are helping us then now get, you know, SOX compliant, which we'll have to do next year. So we've got, uh, we ended up with, uh, I think, 13 months to become fully SOX compliant. So as, as my head of fp a you know, said that I should quote for this, this presentation, what's it like going through a SPAC? It's like running, sprinting up a mountain. And when you get there, you realize you're at Everest Base Camp. So lots, yeah. of work, lots of work left to do and kind of just pivoting to a quarterly mentality from annual, adding the different functions that you never needed before, investor relations, um, internal audit, um, some of the other compliance and governance things. Um, you know, there, there's a, there is a lot that goes to it as, as you're going through the fundraise and the back audits and, you know, there's... Byron, hundred work streams probably going on in the background while you're doing all that, something like that. Yeah, yeah it's a lot. So, so getting the SEC reporting in um, sounds like that was kind of at the beginning of the process. So you guys were going to be good with financials, and then internal audit was just after you became public. Was that correct timing? We were, you know, between when we announced um, and we were going through the SEC review was really when we started adding all those resources with investor relations um, coming just, we just finished that role a couple of weeks ago with our person starting. Okay. Prior to that, we had a, a you know, we outsourced it, but um, a, a critical role that I wanted to make sure that we, we manage the, the way we communicate externally ourselves. Okay. And 
we'll wrap it up on team. I just, I just have one story. I, I like to tell as kind of a word of caution here for, for those who have smaller teams right now and you're scaling and you're looking to, you know, grow that, that function to get ready to go public. We did that at Cornerstone and we made a big mistake with the types of people that we hired. And this is going to sound really weird what I'm about to say, but a lot of people believe they should go out and hire a bunch of A players to build out a team, which makes perfect sense. We should have all A players across our company. Here's the problem in accounting is we did that at Cornerstone. We said, you know what, we're going public. We want to hire all these public company auditors who know this stuff and have done this before. And they did that. They hired a bunch of them. What ends up happening is when you hire people out of public accounting, they expect to be promoted every year like clockwork. And it's a this like cutthroat battle to the top. It's very odd. It happens in accounting where you wouldn't expect this. You think it's like some other field, but people start fighting because they want to jockey for that next promotion because all of a sudden it's not just a thing that happens on an annual cadence. And so we ended up actually having like a pretty bad culture as a team. And one of the things they ended up shifting towards was hiring some people who were comfortable doing their job for the next 20 years, that same job, just sitting in their desk and banging out journal entries or doing the bookkeeping or doing cash collections, like those more mundane roles from a human resources and building out a team perspective, it actually helps to have, right, your doers who are just going to sit there and do the work and not complain about not getting promoted. And then your folks who are ambitious and smart and want to move up and do their thing. So finding the right mix of people along the way, I think is super important and is a problem, you know, at Flowcast, like we're at a point where it's, I, I do want some people who are comfortable just doing their job and not wanting to get promoted every year. That would be really nice if I didn't have to deal with that. So a word of caution heading into that. I know it's weird to suggest that, but in the long run, when you have 50 people in your accounting team, you're going to want that good mix of, of folks. So thinking about that early on, I uh, could help you avoid some issues. And let me go back to sharing my screen here. And I'm trying to figure this out on the fly. So uh, excuse me. But now we talk about always being ready for due diligence. So if you, uh, you know, even if you aren't going public, you always want to be prepared. I mean, for fundraising, for, for example, for us, it can happen very quickly. Investors could approach you. They could want to give you money and you want to have your books sorted out and be able to hand them all that information really quickly. So um, Jared, what are some tips uh, that, that you have for being ready for due diligence? Um, so when I joined, we weren't, we were horribly not, um, we spent a good portion of time. We, 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 we ran several processes, so to speak, to get ready for this back. We had a couple of trial and errors, um, in, in that effort. And I think, you know, the biggest thing from a SaaS company perspective is really get a really granular view of your, all of the contract cohorts around your revenue stream, you know, the, your, your customers by industry, by product, by like you want to have that cut every different way imaginable so that you can give a you know really good data set and really confidence to the to the buyer or the SPAC as the case may be. Um, that was kind of the hardest thing that, that we had to go through was trying to assemble that when we were you know already 180 million in revenue and we didn't really have any of that. All right. And Byron, when you're uh, looking at companies, you know, what's your level of expectation around preparedness? I mean, it's always high, right? We always ask for, I'm sure as, as, it, as probably most people on the phone here have experienced with Insight, uh, we're probably going to ask you for your customer transaction file. As Jared just said, uh, we need, <laughs> you know, the quarterly or even monthly financials. Um, you know, I would say that, that, uh, as you think about being ready for, for an exit, you know, I'd almost think back to, you know, the last time you did a fundraise, right? And what did people actually ask for? And what are the key files that you're always having to pull, right? So, you know, I almost guaranteed to, to Jared's point, like, you know, understanding your contracts and the cohorts and, and the, you know, retentions, bookings, et cetera, behavior within there is, is something that, um, I know we ask for in pretty much every every deal, and so you know, as you think about either the next fundraise or the next uh, or you know a public you know exit um, or just a public event, right? Because a lot of times people are still still going through and still staying with the business. Um, I would I would try and stick to that uh, you know amount of detail, and I think um, you know there there are obviously things like uh getting your legal docs in place and and all of those pieces which um 
I just keep, figure out like what is the right file system and just have those things there. You're probably not gonna, you're not touching them that often. And so, you know, the effort up front, um, I just try and, and codify that. And, and as I think about just advice, like um, everybody's, you know, has a data room at some point, figure out how do you actually make that data room sustainable? Um, and that it doesn't just get cleared off of, you know, whatever site that, that you choose to use at that moment and, and it's and look at it as something that you can just maintain uh, longer term. So uh, that's, that I, it's, it's hard and, it, and it's, you know, if it gets to be too burdensome, like that's why we don't push for it, you know, every year. But I would say like the more you can at least keep older versions in a, in a Dropbox or something like that. Uh, the better. And then probably the only thing you need to keep up to date is, you know, understand where your cohorts are and, and your, your customer contracts. And obviously you guys all, all keep your financials pretty up to date. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We, 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 it's funny because of the transactions, so few people have it. Like we asked for it and it's like pulling teeth to get it. And, and that impacts the price. Like it, it's that important. Like if, if you have it, you get way more conviction around the price you're paying or willing to pay um, versus, you know, when you have to look at partial information and, you know, any sound buyer is firing as one of them would likely then, you know, figure that it's worth a little less because there's more risk in, in just not being, having the visibility to, especially the revenue stream and the growth. I think especially for like a business like like E2 Open was was great is you know Jared was actually pretty good at this but he as as he said like even even though like they have you guys have great processes like the the number of acquisitions that happened make it just harder right and and so I think especially for businesses where there is some level of of inorganic growth or there are a ton of product lines um, being able to keep track of those will increase your your likelihood of getting a deal done because i mean there uh, as we see now there is uh um there there's a lot of you know potential supply out there of, of deals to do and and you know there's sometimes where like the the headache may just not be worth it right if somebody is unsure about what the numbers actually are or unclear about you know 25 percent of your revenue uh that that can be a, just a deterrent to even starting to engage um and trying to figure it out yeah, I mean that that would be concerning if someone couldn't produce a revenue by customer report, right? Rather, yeah. And uh, I, I will say, you know, I, I hate plugging Flowcast too much in these things, but organization and prepared for due diligence is kind of one of the the fallouts of Flowcast. If you use us to close the books every month, we're an organization tool, right? At our heart, and then we integrate with storage providers like Dropbox and Box. So really, if you're if you're just closing on Flowcast, that information is readily available and makes the uh, the process way easier. Like I remember working with insight, right? We obviously close on Flowcast internally. And so it's just like, Hey, here's our, here's our instance, go for it. And all that data is ready to roll. So uh, not to self plug too much, but huge benefit of Flowcast is helping you be, be prepped through that whole thing. Totally and, and we're going to, so we're going to hop to the next slide, but I do want to admit that I'm having technical difficulties on zoom. And with this new, like a uh, present presentation thing that's going on, I'm having a nearly impossible time tracking questions. And so we're going to hold those until the end. And Christina is actually going to, going to hop back in and ask those on my behalf, since I'm having uh, technical difficulties, I think a little bit, but I'm going to try to share my slide again, and we'll get through this, uh, this one. And then I think we do have some questions. So we'll hop over into that, uh, into that portion. So scaling your department, striving for speed, efficiency, and accuracy. I mean, this is one of the big things is when you're a private company, you know, deadlines, we all want to hit deadlines, but in some ways they're negotiable and we might, you know, miss slip by a day or two. When you're a public company, they are non-negotiable. You can't miss filing deadlines and you have to start closing faster and faster. So uh, Jared, let's kick it off with you again. You know, what are some tips for, uh, for being fast, efficient, and accurate as you're growing as a company? Yeah, so um, you, you need the right tool. Now, funny enough, we actually switched general ledgers in the middle of our pipe raise. Um, oh my gosh, what was the switch? Uh, we switched from Great Plains to in, uh, NetSuite. And actually, well, good, good choice for what it's worth, I, I would say. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but, you know, that was something that we launched the effort for a year ago. And, and it was kind of critical for us really being public because the closed process was unsustainable in the com public company environment. 
Yeah. We're actually on two different ledgers because of the, the most recent acquisition. Um, so that's really key to being able to have confidence um, that you're not, you know, consolidating your financial data from multiple systems. Each one creates, you know, another exposure point for something going wrong. Um, but then also, and, and we're still super immature in it, but, you know, developing the efficiency uh, in a more modern ledger system to, you know, automate re your revenue process further and, and automate your close so that you can close under the, you know, the new deadlines that you've got and with the accuracy that you need. Yeah. And, uh, and Byron, what's, what are your expectations on the investor side with, in terms of, you know, receiving financial reporting, all that good stuff? Yeah. I, uh, I remember, you know, as, as we were kind of going through the the process, and, and actually just talking to, to uh, Jared earlier this week, you know, he was like, "Wow, being being public, there there's obviously more time pressure, but they ask a lot fewer questions than Insight does." Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's fewer and easier. It's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> and so honestly, I think like the level of depth, like we to to your point, Mike. Um, we're probably a bit more patient. I remember, you know, we, we spent a long time, this is going back, you know, two years, maybe three years ago. Um, we did, we did some work with, with Jared and, and Pete and, and their team around uh, pipeline forecasting. Right. And like, we spent a long time getting that help with working with them to get the data right and kind of iterating on reports and, and all of that. And so, you know, for us, I'd honestly say like, it's an iterative process. And so like, we're here to, to work with, with teams on, on getting the right reporting in. I think, you know, as I said before, we're always going to want to know like the key metrics for us, especially for, for recurring revenue businesses is like, what does your ARR waterfall look like? If you can answer that simple question of like new upsell, downsell churn and do that, you know, and tie that actually to cohorts, like you're, you're pretty golden. And so, um, you know, for us, uh, however, however you, you get it is is fine, but that's probably the biggest uh, the biggest uh, ask. Um, in terms of the exit process, though, I think the, the to Jared's point, like um, speed actually does matter, and so you know, I I think that as part of and as I talked about earlier, as part of kind of the prep, as we've kind of continued to to get better at this ourselves, um, you know, I think call it eighteen months in advance, we should you know. Myself, others at, at Insight should all be should be sitting down with all all of you guys, uh, if you are if we are considering potentially being public and figuring out like what do we need to invest in because the Jared's point like it takes twelve months and then you 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 would ideally not go through an implementation while you're also doing this other stuff, um, right. so I think I think probably eighteen months out we should be having that conversation. Yeah, that would be the less scary way of doing it, Byron. You don't yeah. you don't want to switch ledgers in the middle of your fundraise. You know that was. But I mean, we, you know, we, it took two years to get the team to that place. It took yeah. to get the ledger mm -hmm. in place with acquisitions mixed in the middle. Um, I, I can't stress enough the, the need to plan ahead because you, you can't pivot in a week or a month or, or in some ways, even a year, if you're not at the right place to do that. Mm -hmm. okay. And I know uh, it can be hard to stomach, you know, G and A spend early on in a, a company's history, just broadly speaking. So, at what point in a company life cycle um, are you comfortable opening up the purse strings a little bit for for some of those back office technology solutions? And I'll I'll start it with uh, yeah, with, I can with, start. with Byron because <laughs> we're, we're we're spending your money, so I'd love to hear about. Yeah, it. no, I mean, I think it depends what it is, right? Like from my perspective, you have your. Um, I'm gonna get the number wrong, but you probably have five core systems, right? You have your your ERP, your CRM, your marketing automation platform, your map. Um, you know, you're gonna have your your support system and kind of ticketing and, and all of that, and then you should have something around, uh, and you have your HRS, right? And then I think those those there's almost never, at least on the first four, there's almost never uh, too early, right? You're gonna need some sense of you know, you probably should, should get off QuickBooks if you're still doing that and, and 
Um, you're going to need financial reporting and consistency. CRM, like you almost have, like you definitely have to have some sort of tracking of like where your sales pipeline is, et cetera. Your map, um, you know, even even for like E2Open where the ASPs are extremely high and it's much more sales oriented than marketing oriented, like you have to have, you are actually targeting back into your base. You are doing marketing into the, even those existing customers to, to expand. Um, and then you have to have some sort of ticketing. So I think those four are, are critical early on. And, you know, I think we're almost always supportive of spending on those. Um, as you think about HRIS, I think that gets to be uh, when you start to have, call it 50 to 100 employees, like you should probably be getting at least some form of HRIS. And there's, there's some lighter weight versions. I'm not talking about going and implementing Workday or something right. like that, but um, I think you can have something light. And then customer success, I think, um, you know, getting like a gain site or, or, or another um, system like that, I think is probably like the sixth system I'd, I'd say is, is kind of in that core bucket. Um, and then, uh, you know, everything, that's probably more when you start to have, you know, three customer success reps, three to five, you probably need to start getting one of those. Um, and then it's really just about how you, how you have, what you need where, like, if I think about that ERP piece, and I think about something like like a like a flowcast, like, um, I think, and you can you can disagree with me, Mike, about how how early you see people come in, but, um, you know, I think like it depends. You could be a small company with a lot of complexity. And if it's hard for you to close the books, you need that automation. You should probably be be implementing like a flowcast. Maybe if if you you know it's a little bit more straightforward, you can wait a bit. But, um, I think we're always we're always uh, open to, to systems. I think, uh, you know, there are some businesses that are probably over systematized. You know, I talked to a CIO the other day of a business that was, you know, 40 million and they probably had 80 different systems. That's probably too much. Um, but I, I think that, uh, you know, our bias is getting the right data and being able to get visibility into your business is critical. And so, yeah. No. yeah. I'll say the the ERP is a big is a big spend, right? Like that's kind of a daunting one to get to do. But um, we so I, th I believe Insight has a partnership with NetSuite, so you can get some yep. preferred pricing and maybe make that a little more uh, palatable up front. Yeah, we have it both with NetSuite and Intact. So yeah, yeah, so I I would take it. They're both great solutions. You know, it just depends on your needs. But we we did it very early at Flowcast, and so we have every transaction in the history of our company is in NetSuite. So there's no cutoff or anything like that, and just having all of that in one system makes our life significantly easier as we've scaled. So we've been able to do more with less people and not having that system switching. It means the auditors get to go only focus on one system and do all that. It just, it does provide a lot of benefits down the road. So particularly with the discounting available from insight, maybe something to consider earlier than most companies might have historically. And yeah, I'm not going to say Flowcast is the first thing. It's after the ERP. You should get the ERP sorted out, kind of get all yeah. that process going and then, you know, figure out the right timing for the other ones. But that's good to hear you're supportive of ERPs a little yeah, earlier definitely. than historically. Yeah, definitely. Super supportive. And I would also say, right to your point, like when you're early on in your scaling journey, uh, that implementation is going to be easier than when you're at, you know, Jared's scale yes. and you two open scale, like it can be a pretty painful process to get everything moved over, especially as you go multi-product, multi-geo. Yeah, we, we were on zero for 18 months and then moved over yeah. to NetSuite and it was a three month thing for us, piece of cake and we've, and we've scaled on it. So yeah, you take a little bit of pain up front, you avoid a lot on the, lot on the back end. Agreed. And just keep asking for a lower price. They'll even go down, they'll go down even more. They're pretty easy <laughs> to negotiate with. Um, all right, so we have reached the, the end of our presentation. We have about eight minutes left. So Christina, if you could, could chime in and ask us any of those questions, we'd love to uh, take care of those and then head off on our day here. Wonderful. Let's do it. So first question, this is for Jared. What was the most incremental lift during that process? Was it the additional transaction testing, adopting public company standards, internal controls? Yeah. Um, and this is re in regard to the, piece, the conversion from AICPA to PC AOB audit standards. Um, I'd say it was really the first two. Um, controls are more post-public um, work that we'll do for SOX, although, you know, there is some reliance in terms of scoping that uses the internal controls you have. Um, it, it was a combination of reducing the scope and then going back two years and doing, you know, another 
couple hundred revenue transaction selections from an audit perspective as kind of one bucket of work. And then the second was, you know, the, the different accounting um, requirements. So like around EPS and income tax, I think were the two kind of bigger areas that, that we needed to kind of go revisit, redo, or do for the first time. Um, so it, it, was, it was both. I, I'd say both were an equivalently big lift. And, and it's that activity more than just, you know, reconsolidating and, and adding disclosure to the financial statements um, that took the bulk of the two months that, that we used to get that work done. Great. Another question, how big of an issue was revenue recognition and what resource would you bring in to manage that? Uh, huge. I mean, huge. That's, that's our biggest audit risk is revenue. Um, our revenue transactions that, you know, Byron mentioned that, you know, big ASP, very multi-element, complicated. Um, most of our customers, we start with their paper. So they're all bespoke contracts. RevRec was one of the company went at the Take Private, one of their biggest focus in building out a dedicated team of, you know, revenue experts that work throughout the year with our auditors. And we, you know, big, big and or complicated and or new um, uh, contracts, we, we run and pre-clear kind of the, our revenue recognition with our auditors to kind of limit the exposure we have from a, an audit adjustment perspective. Um, that, that's my biggest concern in our financial statements is that we, you know, have reported our quarters publicly all along and we come to our annual audit and they do a review and, you know, we either bust one of the allocation assumptions that we use to um, divide services and, and SaaS, or we, you know, we just miss something in a contract and we have a revenue adjustment. So we have a, a very, we, we invest a good bit of our accounting resources in, you know, a dedicated RevRec team that looks at every deal. Great. And there are quite a bit of number of questions. So um, we'll try to get through them all. And if not, we'll answer them afterwards and send them back to everyone. Next question. When is the right time to build an IR function and should this sit within finance? Uh, I believe it should sit in finance. Um, we, we waffled a little bit on whether that was a legal or a marketing activity, but, but the content and the relationships are so relevant to the CFO role. Um, that, that we have it working very closely with legal and marketing, but it re reports directly to me. Um, I think you're okay, at least from a SPAC pur purpose, I think you're okay doing it after, after you're out the door. Um, your sponsor likely already has a lot of investor relations experience and help. And so, like I said, it's a marriage, not a divorce. So you're, you're getting help. You know, once, once you kind of agree to terms, um, you know, in some ways they're not a buyer anymore, they're your partner. Um, and we, we relied on them and, and CC and Newberger's experience in investor relations and what to do and what not to do and making sure we're set up for, you know, beating and raising rather than missing and surprising. And, um, you know, started building out our ESG reporting and um, we got a lot of help through the SPAC. I think if you're doing a traditional IPO, you probably want that earlier in the process to kind of help you so that then they retain the relationships with the, with the people that you, you know, interacted with during your roadshow. Yeah. But I think you can, my, my, my bias is I think you can wait until you're pretty much sure on the timeline of going public and wait you know, near, near towards the end. And, and um, I say that because there are firms that literally just do IR outsourcing and like, and like that, that you can provide some scale for, for you and like, you know, they're actually pretty good. So um, I would say like getting that internal hire I, out of all the things you have to do, it's probably not, you know, top five in my list. Yep. I'd agree. Another question in an IPO, how far back do they go with accounting records? Um, I'll take a stab. I think uh, that is the one shortcut for the back office that a SPAC delivers is because the SPAC is typically a emerging growth company due to its size and scale. You get a break in terms of how many years of financials you need to present in your S4 versus just a straight S1. So we only had to go back 
two years plus than the, the current year we were in, I believe a traditional IPO is, is three or five. Um, it's, it's a bigger requirement to file under a S1 initially. Yeah, Not we we were traditional and it was three years uh, looking back, yeah. but also we had long-term contracts running. So we would sign three to five year deals. So we would have to, you know, if any deal trailed into that three years before I had to go back and restate all the revenue around that. So it was kind of a pain hybrid, but it's, it's three years is what they're looking at. Great. Are there major financial or operational variables that extend across these industries to focus on earlier in prep for a SPAC versus just a standard PE exit? That was a complicated question. It's yeah, a, I mean, I think it's mostly. I think that's for Byron. Yeah, <laughs> no. I would argue, um, as, as we kind of alluded to earlier, there's actually probably fewer metrics you need uh, going public. You have to make sure that you're like gap compliant and you are like, that has to be on point and, and uh, defensible and fully audited to the, to the nth degree. Um, and for public versus for, for private, like they're going to want, you know, full on pro forma. They're going to want, uh, if you've done acquisitions, they're, you know, will want, you know, every kind of retention metric and bookings metric, you know, for, for if you really wanted to, you could do it mostly just revenue, you know, operating income and, you know, call it, you know, and calculate some sort of EPS. But it's just like, um, I think there's probably going to be some metrics that you want to show as a business to the public markets to show that you are like on a good trajectory. And so like, if you have a lot of, if you have long implementation cycles and, and you want, but you want to show that you're booking, like maybe you do show ARR. I don't, I wouldn't recommend it, but um, there are metrics. Or if you really want to say, Hey, we started landing a bunch of big, um, you know, enterprise customers, maybe you show, you know, percent of customers, a number of customers um, that are over a certain size. So I would say it really depends on the business, but the baseline level requirements of what you need to show going public are, you know, gap financial, at least in the U.S., gap financials. And, and um, as long as you have those, you're, you're, you're actually pretty fine. Yeah, you, you, you get a lot more flexibility than you do with a traditional private equity debt package or that you would, you know, be expected to present to a private equity board. I think um, that is an area we, we retained all of that because we find it useful to run the business, but in terms of what we give the public, it's very, very limited. And you've got a lot more flexibility about what adjusted EBITDA is or is not. <clears throat> Great. Well, I know we're up on time. Thank you, gentlemen, for an amazing webinar today. If anyone has time to take that last poll, it'd be great to get your feedback. And we will be sharing a recording of this webinar later today, as well as links to some special offerings from our partners at Flowcast. Thank you, everyone, for taking time today. We look forward to speaking and seeing you soon. Yeah, thanks for taking thanks, the time. Everyone.